The Bible begins with a wedding, and the Bible ends with a wedding. This is worth thinking about. It's worth meditating upon. Now, as we start today, I should say again what I said last week. Jesus is the living embodiment of grace and truth, isn't he? Jesus is a living embodiment of grace and truth. This is core to who we are as his apprentices. The church is a community alive by and alive with grace and truth. Jesus welcomes the wounded. He reaches out for the marginalized. He heals the heartbroken. He embraces the shamed and the lonely. Jesus ministers in truth and love. He ministers truth and love, and he loves with truth. This is his way. He has taken our sin upon himself, and he has spoken to us words of life. Go and and sin no more. And he calls us his beloved. He calls us to be holy. And he doesn't, he doesn't browbeat us. It's not his way. Instead, he lifts up our face with compassionate gentleness. Now, I want to acknowledge that there are those here today who need healing. And there are those here today who need to submit their sexuality to Jesus. And when I say there are those who need healing and those who need to submit their sexuality to Jesus, I mean all of us. Every one of us. Every one of us. Heterosexual, gay, bi, transgender, whatever our attraction or however we identify are all called to a holy sexuality. To live in accordance with God's design for our lives and to honor the bodies that he has graciously given us. See, when we are welcomed into the community of God's people, we are welcomed into a sex ethic of God's design and not our own. Every human being is in need of redemption, right? We can agree on that. Every human being is in need of redemption and transformation into Christ likeness. It is the historic and global position that our sin nature affects every aspect of our being. And by that, I don't mean we are completely, you know, um, as sinful as we can be. But what that doctrine means is that every faculty of our being is affected by sin, our heart, our mind, right? Our, Our will, our imagination, our emotions, our body. Every aspect of our being is affected by sin and needs to be transformed to come into conformity with Christ's likeness. And that means our sexuality as well is touched by sin, all of ours. And so let me be very clear today as we navigate this uh, challenging subject. Uh, The goal today is to see Jesus as Lord over all creation. The church is called to live by a biblically defined vision of marriage, sexuality, and gender called to a holy sexuality. And so my aim this morning, whether I am successful or not, is to paint a good, beautiful, and true vision of the Christian sex ethic. And this is a call to holy sexuality, to honoring God with our God-given bodies. And this is a call that comes to all of us, to absolutely all of us. And then this is key, this is key. This is a call that comes at a cost to all of us. It comes at a cost. Our sexuality is simply not immune to the calling of picking up our cross daily. So no one will leave here today without some cross to carry that requires the sufficiency of God's grace. So remember, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. There is simply no following Jesus without a cross of self-denial. Also, another aligning ground rules thing as we move forward this morning. There is a malady uh, in the public sphere, so to speak, an unreasonable idea that's in our cultural waters or that, that haunts public discourse in the West. And it is the idea that thinks to disagree with someone is to disrespect them. To not believe the same thing is to not love them is the general idea. And I believe we should make it plain just to help us all out a bit on that you can love someone and disagree with them, right? 
Not only that, I would even say you can love someone by disagreeing with them. I think we can all, we can all agree there's no greater embodiment example of compassion and love and mercy than Jesus Christ himself, right? He loved perfectly. He loved absolutely perfectly. And he often disagreed with people. But because he disagreed with them didn't mean he disrespected them. He actually entered into disagreement with them because he respected them, their value and their worth and their dignity, and wanted to see them flourish. By the way, if this is not the case that you can love someone and disagree with them, or you can love someone by disagreeing with them, if this isn't the case, then all benevolent public discourse is dead and useless. All loving intervention or reasoning together for the common good should be shut down if love requires total affirmation and complete lack of disagreement. Also, one, one other thing, I want to manage some expectations. <laughs> this sermon can only do so much and include so much, right? Unless you want to stay here for the next five hours. And then that's still the beginning of this conversation that we're in, okay? Um, I will disappoint some expectation of what some of you think I should or should not include in here. And so I just simply ask for your grace. Ask for your grace and mercy and your patience, and I'm, I believe you'll give it to me. I thank you for that. Um, now, uh, so to our authority on marriage, sexuality, and gender, um, to Scripture. <clears throat> uh, a key question as we enter into this conversation is, is how does one define marriage? How does one define marriage? Where do we get our definition of marriage? And as Christians, we get our definition of marriage from the Scriptures. So to be as plain as possible, if you don't believe the Bible is the actual revealed Word of God, you will likely disagree with, with our position um, on, on marriage as it hinges upon God's revelation. Marriage is not a cultural construct in our understanding, but it is a divine cosmic design. Marriage is not a cultural construct, but it is a divine cosmic design. And so no bones about it, right? To Scripture, we go as our authority. And we're going to begin with Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, which we already did some work in last week when we talked about the sanctity of human life. Now, here's what Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28 say. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, <clears throat> over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. Now God has created human beings to bear his image, and he has done so in a way that includes likeness, and difference, that point towards unity. And in, in the Hebrew, this text highlights biological sex differences done through these key words and context and structuring, done through these key words is zakar and nekebah. Now these two, these two words speak of gender through physiology and, and links these together. And I, I know already some questions are popping up in minds. That's okay. They will throughout this whole thing, I guarantee you. Gender and biological sex are woven together. Contextually, we see this, this meaning here. The very next sentence says, to be fruitful and multiply. This is talking about biological reproduction. The same words, by the way, zakar and nekebah, are used of the animal pairs that go into the ark when you go a couple chapters to the right. These are the same words. So it's talking about biological function and reproduction here, which is then attached to gender. Scripture shows God has written sex differentiation into his design. Humanity is made in God's image. Humanity is a diversity created dimorphically, male and female. These two have unique, non-interchangeable glories. Their likeness and differences are linked to bearing God's image. We are embodied sexed and gendered beings. Now that said, um, it has been said biological sex is a social construct. Not so. This is, this is not just Bible denying. This is science denying. One of the very first things that, that we learn in, in science class in elementary school is that human beings are, are sexually dimorphic beings. 
But then all sorts of questions will come up for sure. Like, well, what about earthworms? Some say they're not dimorphic. That's, that's correct. But what about earthworms? We're not earthworms or chimera butterflies or clownfish or a number of other things that have different uh, design. Earthworms are not image bearers of God. Well, other questions arise for sure. I mean, they've been in my mind for a long time now. What of intersex? Intersex um, is an extreme minority that doesn't deny any dignity or value in any way, shape, or form. But it is an extreme minority, 0.018% of the population. And 99% of of those that are um, intersex are unambiguously male or female, even though they have atypical variations, both uh, either internally or externally. And, and, and not only that, so many of those who um, are intersex um, don't want to be a pawn and have said, please don't use us as this back and forth um, in, the, in this conversation because we identify as male or female based upon our, our biology. And so we have to be really careful when we start to bring in these things. Also, by the way, an atypical case does not rewrite the rule. It often reinforces it. And so we have to be really careful as we handle all of this material, as we think through things. Because we're not just dealing with stats and numbers. We're dealing with human beings, right? We're dealing with human beings. So in, in short, as we continue to move through this, Sex differences are woven into the very fabric of creation according to Genesis. The embodied gender reality is then linked with marriage as we move on to the next chapter. Marriage is not a cultural construct. It is a divine cosmic design. So let's continue on to Genesis 2, verses 20 through 25. Here's what it says. But for Adam, no suitable helper. We're going to come to this. It's very important. Ezer Kenegdo, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs. The word here is side. It's like the, the it's like it, it deals with an architecture, like a, a sacred architecture, like um, an altar. The side of it, right? Takes a side and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from a rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why, or you could translate it, for this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Okay, so catch this. Here's what's going on. The man at this point is alone. Created by God. He's observing the animal kingdom. It's his commission from God. He's observing and naming them, scientifically categorizing them, so to speak. And what would Adam notice as he watches the animal kingdom, right? Well, they are pairing off. They are having sex. He would have observed both male and female sheep, female and male eagles and donkeys and dogs and on. But then he would observe that he has no one. He has no physiological counterpart. So God creates the woman, the Isha, who is like the male, Ish, but different. She is corresponding what you could call a like opposite. This is where we come to this word, kenegdo. Here we see sex difference as key to, to marriage. Now, kenegdo is a compound word in Hebrew of two, two prepositions. Key, the first part, means similar or alike. It's a very common word, similar or alike. But then the second word, is a Hebrew word which is neged. And this word uh, means something different. It's referring to difference and something is not similar. So it's like similar is, is this thing coming together, keneg do. So the term is highlighting these sex differences. They are male and female. Their differential biology is key to who they are. This sex difference is a key aspect of design. And now as we're going to see marriage and expression of sexuality, their created counterparts and complements. And in verse 24, it says, for this reason, for this reason. So this is connecting back to the previous verse. Marriage is intrinsically linked to sex difference. And then we have this incredible, the first song, the first human song sung, at least that we have a record of. And it's this. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. 
And this is brilliant because what we see is equality. It's a san- an equality sandwich. Equality. Bone of my bones. Right? They, they are fully equal. Flesh of my flesh. This is the sameness. This is the key part of keneg do. And then we see she shall be called woman. Isha is different than ish. Woman is different than man. There is difference. This is the neged part of keneg do. And then we see again equality, for she was taken out of man. Equality, similarity, difference, equality, all wrapped up. So for this reason, equality and sexual difference are designed for union, for flourishing, to extend the bounds of the garden and God's shalom in this world. Now this brings us then to a definition of marriage. Marriage is the covenantal union of a man and a woman. Biological sex difference is intrinsic to what marriage is. Is this really the case? Is this the case? Well, is this just an Old Testament thing? Are we misinterpreting this? Well, let's let's continue to do some, some work. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 19. Does Jesus have anything to say about this? He does, actually. So Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 5. You can turn there if you'd like. It'll be up here on the screens. Um, In context, Jesus is talking with the religious leaders about divorce. He's talking about marriage and divorce. That's the context. And something very enlightening is is put forward here. So here's what Jesus says in verse 4. He says, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? Okay, so what is Jesus doing? He's referencing Genesis. Genesis 1, verse 27. And, he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother to be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. What did he do there? He referenced Genesis 2, verse 24. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Well, do you see what Jesus just did? He just explicitly linked biological sex difference to the definition of marriage. And he says, for this reason, the two, two sexually different persons, are united in a covenantal union for flourishing. Marriage, one flesh, duality, and sex difference are both necessary for marriage. So for Jesus, marriage was the covenantal union of a man and a woman. Now, um, we should ask, where do we get our definition of marriage from? Do we get it from the scriptures? Do we get it from Scotus 2015, Supreme Court decision? Is marriage consensual and mutual union of two persons? If so, why? Where do we get the definition from? Is it personal opinion? Again, is it Supreme Court? They've been known to change definitions and and rewrite things. What's our basis? What's our origin for our definition of marriage? Is it Netflix or social media or just somehow imbibed? Or is it based on Scripture? We should think deeply about this. We should think deeply about this. And, and also at this point, um, it's helpful for us to acknowledge um, the use of another word that's used often in the New Testament. And this is the word porneia. And here's, here's why I want to talk about this. Uh, Jesus and Paul use this word often. Um, and this word is in relation to the understanding of marriage that Jesus and Paul and the scripture writers had. The meaning is found in relation to marriage. So Mark, take, take Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. These are the words of Jesus. He says, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, that's the word porneia, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Okay, so this, this word porneia is any sexual activity outside of marriage. This is how it is, it's, it's used. It's an umbrella reference to the sexual sins that we see in the Old Testament, including what's found uh, in, in Leviticus, which includes same-sex um, sexual behavior. And in the Jewish culture, marriage was the covenantal union of a man and a woman. Any sexual activity, whether heterosexual or same-sex, was outside of that union. And by the way, there's a bunch of other sins put in that list, aren't there? <laughs> but it's funny how we sometimes will only hone in on one and talk about that while we are actually living out the other ones. Lord, help us to engage scriptures well. 
over and over again throughout the New Testament, followers of Jesus are called to grow in their likeness of Christ, right? And it's our great goal to be like Jesus. And this means by repenting of and no longer engaging in sexual immorality or porneia, which, by the way, I'm sure you imagine, and you can make this connection, includes pornography. All of us are called to a holy sexuality. This is not some us versus them kind of game we are playing. This is all of us. There is much sexual sanctification that needs to happen among God's people. Pornography is rampant among all sexual orientations. We got that? <laughs> uh, it's, it's there. It's there, and the Lord help us through, through this. His mercy meets us, thankfully. Um, so for Jesus to say, no porneo for you, it's not the way, includes same-sex sexual behavior as that is outside of the covenantal union of a man and a woman of the understanding of the Jewish culture and Jesus' understanding. So, so to say Jesus never ever addressed same-sex sexuality is, is similar to accusing somebody of who says, I'm a vegetarian, and then saying, well, they, they, ne- they were never clear about whether they eat filet mignon or not. Well, one statement includes the other. And I don't, I don't use that kind of analogy to cheapen this or, or to, to make, in, make this um, somehow less um, difficult for, for people. Um, what Jesus is saying is, no porneia. Here's what marriage is. Here's God's design. Living outside of that through heterosexual or homosexual sin, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. So Jesus calls us to faithfulness, to the Lord's design. Um, <clears throat> so something else here that I, I think we need to understand, and here's another key observation. Every time the scriptures address same-sex sexual behavior, it is in the negative and or explicitly prohibited. It's never blessed. This, this is a really powerful observation that I think we have to come to terms with and figure out what to do with. What, um, this is a really powerful thing to wrestle with. Every time, every time the scriptures address same-sex sexual behavior, it is in the negative and or explicitly prohibited. It is never blessed. Now we see this in a number of passages. Genesis 19 Leviticus 18, 22 and 20, 13. Romans 1, verses 26 through 27. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10. 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 through 10. This longitudinal, non-blessable, and negative depiction is a key point. Along the long storyline of Scripture, whenever same-sex sexuality is mentioned, it's, it's never blessed. It's always negative and prohibited. There is a uniformity to the testimony of Scripture here that has to be reckoned with if we're saying the Scriptures are our authority on how we should live. It requires very, very strange mental and linguistic gymnastics to be done in order to dismiss this uniformity as unimportant to this conversation. And by the way, these passages are often called, anybody know? The clobber passages, right? You know, and God forgive us where we have used God's word to clobber people instead of apply balm to their wounds. They have been called the clobber passages because they have often been pulled out of context and, and, and wielded as, as a hammer. Or as, as a dagger instead of a scalpel that is actually helpful in doing soul surgery. The fact is that these have been used in unloving ways and distorted all over the place. But that doesn't remove the fact that every time the scriptures address same-sex behavior, it is in the negative and or explicitly prohibited and is never blessed. Now some will say, okay, I, I hear you, but those verses aren't actually talking about loving, consensual sexual relationships. They are talking about cases of abuse, of masters raping slaves, of old men using young men in the pederasty culture of Hellenism, which was normative. That is, that is a fantastic question and, 
and a conversation point. It's, it's very key. First, regardless, regardless, every time the scripture addresses same-sex sexual behavior, it is in the negative and or explicitly prohibited and not blessed. Second, there were terrible power dynamics commonly expressed in abusive same-sex behavior, masters and slaves in the pederasty culture. It was normative, and it was absolutely everywhere. That is historical fact. Yet, here's what we have to contend with. The scriptures don't specify any of these cases as only cases of abuse. Rather, they refer to same-sex behavior in general terms. So you take Romans chapter 1, for instance. Unqualified language is used. It simply says male and female, uh, or males with males and females with females. And there's a deep language of mutuality that's used. In Romans, it states that they, they have these desires for each other and act upon them for each other. So let's look at Romans here for a few moments. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. It says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. So they're not honoring their bodies the way God has um, asked them to honor them. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who was forever praised Amen. Now because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural, contrary to nature ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So a couple things. I don't have time to go through this in depth. We can always have more conversations afterwards. I would love to talk with you more about these things. Um, nature here was used in mean, to mean in accordance with creative or creation and design. And unnatural, likewise, was meant to be contrary to nature, which, by the way, was a, a Greco-Roman standard way of talking about same-sex sexual behavior. Just, that's in the history books. That's how they talked about it. They called it contrary to nature or contrary to design. It's there in the ancient documents. God says they, they have allowed desires to override design. They have allowed desires to override design. They are not honoring their bodies, their sexuality, their gender, as they are not living in accordance with God's design. Okay. How are we? Um, we're here. Okay, we're still here at least. All right. Let's take a moment to breathe and ask a couple questions. Let's take a moment to breathe and ask a couple questions. First, um, by not affirming same-sex sexual behavior, are we being unloving towards those who are gay? Categorically, no, of course not. Disagreement does not mean disrespect or lack of of love. In fact, again, one can love someone by disagreeing. If that disagreeing calls them towards flourishing. And biblical repentance is a turn not to destruction, but it's a turn to healing, to wholeness, not to harm. Well, another question then, uh, what about this? Is the historical view of marriage that we've been talking about, sexual uh, of marriage, sexuality and gender harmful to LGBTQ people? Um, if, if it means that you have used it as a weapon and you have been unkind and insensitive and not treated human beings as image bearers of God, but you have demonized them, well, then that wrong is in how it has been used. The problem isn't in the ethical teaching. I understand it is a hard teaching. I understand that. The problem isn't in the ethical teaching of Jesus in the scriptures. It's in the abuse of the truth, which happens all the time. And let me be clear, the church at large has failed to love people well. While holding this view of marriage, sexuality, and gender, we oppose any mistreatment of those who identify themselves as LGBTQ or are same-sex attracted. Every person is to be treated with dignity as they are an image bearer of God and they are loved by him. And Christ died to see all of our flourishing. Everyone is to be treated with dignity and respect. 
those who experience same-sex attraction. And I know there are many of you here who do. And so please, please hear that this is coming from a place of love and compassion and not just, it's not, it's not nameless, it's not faceless. There are stories, there are relationships here. So, so please, please know that. So, so let me finish my, my thought. There are those who experience same-sex attraction or are struggling with gender identity or gender dysphoria. They all deserve dignity and respect. Brother, sister, you deserve respect and you are precious and you are loved. Amen. Christians should demonstrate this love and thought, word, and deed. And words and humor that demean or dehumanize those who are LGBTQ or same-sex attracted those words and that humor has no place in this church family. It has no place in the church at all. Another question we should wrestle with. Does the Bible condemn gay people? Are they an abomination? Doesn't Leviticus 18 verses 22 and 20 verse 13 say they're an abomination? Well, let me, let me tackle this by saying first, the Bible condemns all people. <laughs> heterosexual, gay, bi, trans. The Bible condemns all people who live in unrepentant sin and don't entrust their life to Jesus who was for them. The Bible calls out heterosexuals for sin over and over and over again and says they will not inherit the kingdom if they live in it. Second, Leviticus says it is an abomination, not they. Have you noticed that? Go back and do your good scriptural work. Look at Leviticus 18, verse 22, and 20, verse 13. It says, it, the act, the behavior, is an abomination, not the person. By the way, there's all sorts of other abominations that heterosexual people commit. And it is it, it is those acts that are the abominations. Another question. Is same-sex attraction a sin? Attraction's an interesting, complicated thing, isn't it? So, um, heterosexual people are attracted to people of the opposite sex. So, does that mean it's a sin to be attracted to people of the opposite sex, if you're single or if you're married to somebody else? Or is it what you do with that attraction, what you do with that temptation? Does that make sense? Like we need to understand that there are these things that rise up within us and temptation itself isn't a sin. Was Jesus tempted? It says Jesus was tempted. Was he a sinner? In no way, shape, or form. It is what we do with, with the thoughts, the imaginations, with our actions that enters us into the category of, of sin. We need to be careful with how we understand these things. Here's another one. Maybe you think, well, could it be the church has been wrong? It's been wrong before, just like with slavery. Now we know a lot more. We're more advanced. We're more enlightened. It's important to recognize there has been a 2,000-year-old global, historic, and multi-denominational agreement regarding these things up until recent history. This is a profound consensus, again, that we have to wrestle with. Whether you, you agree with it or not, we have to wrestle with that. This consensus... And its tradition doesn't make it right, by the way, okay? But it is the case that this is how the church has interpreted, interpreted these scriptures for about 2,000 years, and they knew Greek and Hebrew well because that was a lot of their original language. And by the way, there's a huge abuse of scriptures that was, that was used to prop up slavery, Right? We know this. There was a huge abuse of scriptures in churches that, that propped up slavery. But that was not because that was the orthodox reading for 2,000 years. That was the aberration. That was the heresy that needed to be squashed. And the gospel needed to be preached. And people needed to see that everyone was an image bearer of God. And there was no subhuman human being. So to say, well, the scriptures got it, or the church got it wrong with slavery, yeah, but that was an abnormal aberration reading. That wasn't the, the orthodox teaching of Jesus. Jesus in no way ever occurred with that, uh, ever believed that. He never taught that. That was sinful human beings trying to justify their own brokenness. It was, by the way, 
proper use of scripture that fought against the slave trade through William Wilberforce and others that, that fought against slavery, that fought against unfair treatment, right? The historic and global position of the church is that we are of equal worth and we are to love the slave as our brother and that no human being should be treated as, prop, as property. I think that's the scriptural teaching. Next, what about this one? Well, maybe you're thinking, Heath, you are a heterosexual, privileged white male. Look at you. Okay, yeah. Yes. Well, how can you see this properly? Aren't you biased? Again, there has been a 2,000-year-old global, historic, multi-denominational agreement regarding these things. This is not a white privileged position. This is a position that has been historically held by peoples of all skin colors, heritage, and socioeconomic statuses throughout the centuries. There are churches that are predominantly made of all sorts of different colors and socioeconomic statuses all over the world that believe this is the scriptural view. Also, something else to consider here, the desire for LGBTQ human rights ultimately has no basis unless there is a transcendent source of human rights. Remember we talked about personhood theory last week? If personhood theory is where we get uh, human rights, you know, you're a human being, but you don't really have rights until you reach personhood, if that is the only way to give equal human rights, then we're in trouble. There has to be some transcendent source, and that transcendent source comes from our Creator God and is revealed in the Scriptures. Now, to appeal to this transcendent source for human rights, but then disavow the same Bible text when it comes to God's design for marriage and sexuality is is incoherent and inconsistent. Yes, we should appeal to God's design for human rights. Yes. And we should also appeal to God's design for a, a sex ethic that leads to flourishing. We don't get to accept one and reject the other. So this leads us, um, how, do we, how do we respond better than we have historically? How do we respond biblically? We are called to a holy sexuality of God's design. And what does this look like? What are our options? There are two, and they are extremely costly. We are called to a holy sexuality, and this means trusting God by way of chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage. These are the two biblically blessed options. Both of these require a very high view of sexuality in the body. They're sacred. Both of these require submitting our sexuality to our Lord. We're not our own. Both of these require self-denial and discipline, picking up a cross. So a few things on this. Um, I imagine some might say, oh, wow, that's really great, Heath. Super convenient for you. You're heterosexual and you're married. Doesn't seem our crosses are quite the same. I feel you. I agree. They're not the same. Our crosses are not the same. Fully agree. I don't think we all carry the same kind of cross at all. Jesus writes our stories differently, and it seems that we all carry differently weighted and shaped crosses. And let me say, I'm not minimizing the weight or the shape of the cross that you carry if you're wrestling with, with your, your, your gender, your sexuality, your identity. I'm not minimizing that at all. The crosses may be different, yes, but in God's wisdom we carry the cross that we carry and his grace is sufficient for that cross. Now, um, we have to rid ourselves of the notion that we can follow Jesus in a way that has no costs. And we often want to build Christianity as this thing that has no cost for us. That's not how the cross works. There is no costless or crossless Christianity. We should also consider that marriage and sexual intercourse are not necessary for flourishing or for us to fulfill our calling as worshipers. If so, Jesus and untold number of faithful saints throughout the centuries were less and we're unable to live life to the full. In fact, Jesus tells us that some are not called to to marriage. In Matthew 19, he says some are not called to marriage. He says some choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. That is not sexually active, not engaging. They live unmarried, not sexually active, and that's their vocation. 
And we need to understand, by the way, that our sex lives are not the core of our personhood. They are important, but they are not the core of our personhood. So if you, listen to this, if we say you must be married or able to have sex to find fulfillment or joy or reach your human potential, then what's done is that the LGBTQ movement is putting forward our, their own version of the idolatry of marriage that happens in conservative circles that marginalizes and almost dehumanizes singles who are called to chastity and singleness for the rest of their life. And that happens in the church all the time. We don't honor those who are single. They, they somehow become second-class citizens. And when we put forward, you must be able to get married and have sex in order to be a fully functioning human person, what we, have we just done to all those that God has called to live in singleness? We've demeaned them. And that's so sad. In our sex-obsessed world, we must learn that marriage and human sexuality are not ultimate, but are grace-given pointers to God. And God is redeeming, in his redeeming grace, uses faithful marriage and chaste singleness to show forth his glory and transform us into his image by carrying the crosses that he's given us. So this means a few things. A couple more minutes here. I I know I'm going to go a few minutes long today, but this is important. This means that as apprentices, we are to cultivate a culture of grace and truth in the church that seeks to live out the biblical sex ethic. To be a place where people can wrestle with their sexuality, confess and repent without being demonized, shunned, or shamed. How are we doing on that? We are all in process. This needs to be a safe place to have these conversations. And I don't know if it has been. And I don't know if I've led this conversation well. And I'm sorry for that. If it's made you feel like you have to hide the things that you're wrestling with because there's not enough grace in the body of Christ to care for you. That is not how it should be. This means we need to talk about these things. This means that there needs to be more confessing of sexual sin and less shaming of it. This means doing our due diligence in meditating on Scripture and not just imbibing from culture what feels right. That means we are to be a people who love, listen to, and care for LGBTQ and same-sex attracted people. It means we acknowledge that our sexuality, all of it, needs to be sanctified. Now to close, let's go back to the beginning. Let's talk about God's design of the cosmos. The fact that God has created us as embodied and gendered gendered beings, differentiated and complementary, and has created a cosmic construct called marriage, which requires the male-female sex difference. All that tells us something. Our bodies have meaning. Sex, marriage, and gender, these things are sacred. They're sacred as they are signs. What's the big deal, we might say? Well, can't we just focus on the gospel and put this stuff aside? Isn't this a secondary issue? This is a gospel issue. These things are extremely important. Because our sexual differentiation, our biology, covenantal union, these things are loaded with meaning as image bearers of God. Our difference in equality and likeness speak to our design for union, which reflects God's divine nature. It reflects that he's triune, three in one, one in three, differentiation and sameness. You see the connection there? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, differentiated persons in relationship with one another that brings flourishing in life. And so to disavow complementary genders, rejecting the body, ignoring our biology, is to reject the divine design that points us not only to our creator and to our own nature, but to what he's doing in this world. So recall, the Bible begins with a wedding and it ends with a wedding. We need to think long and hard about that because all this points to Jesus. In creation, God brought binary pairs together. I know we could talk about intermediate states, dawn and dusk, but that's honestly missing the understanding of the Hebrew literary structure here. In creation, God brought binary pairs together, heaven and earth, land and sea, day and night, male and female, and they were to display his glory and flourishing. But here's the deal. The great pair that was to be united and walk together was not simply Adam and Eve. The great pair that was to walk together was humanity and God. Adam and Eve's marriage was a pointer to that ultimate union. And it's a scene when the church is called the bride of Christ and Jesus is called the groom. The ultimate meaning of marriage is to be a signpost, a sacred, lived out parable of Christ and his church. And the design of marriage 
sexuality and gender, we see written into creation a signpost of God's plan for all humanity, union with Jesus. Now, does that sound crazy? Am I making this big meta connection up? Let me read Paul briefly here, and then we'll move on. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 through 32 says the following. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. What's he referring to? Back to Genesis, Genesis 2. And then he says, ah, but this is a profound mystery. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ and the church. It all points to Jesus and the church. Paul says the sacred union of marriage, of our sexuality and gender, is at its very heart about Jesus and us being united with our God. And so in summation, in summation, marriage, sexuality, and gender are sacred signposts. The Christian sex ethic is grounded in who God is, in how humans were originally created, and in our intended destiny, union with God through Jesus Christ. The debate about marriage and LGBTQ does not hinge on some decontextualized clobber passages. It rests upon the whole story arc of the Bible, what God is doing to dwell with the people who have rejected him and to show us how he has created the cosmos and how he has created our sexuality and physical bodies to speak that truth. The scriptures begin with the wedding and they end with the wedding. And in the middle of the rebellion and brokenness is the costly love and redeeming cross of Jesus. Wedding, wedding, costly cross in the middle. This is a story of reality that we are called into. This is a story that shapes our sexual ethic. This shows our sex and gendered bodies as sacred. And this is the truth that loads faithful marriage and chaste singleness with the divinely ordained meaning. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me and my friends. Um, I pray you are honored in this and that people are loved well. Um, And forgive me where I have erred um, and not loved well in in the past. And um, Lord, I I thank you for the opportunity to talk about these things with people I love. Do your wonderful work in our hearts. We love you. We need you. It's, it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.